Welcome back to Times of Refreshing, Returning to Rest. What a message the Lord has given us to share in this six-week series. This is week five, You Were Made for Rhythms. And as we've been talking about, we have learned together that times of refreshing, returning to rest, is the heart of God. This is why he said, as Peter preached in the book of Acts, that his people could return to him and find times of refreshing in his presence. And we, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, have the privilege of having this rest given to us on a consistent basis. But there's really not enough teaching about it, and it is the need of our times. Because we're living in days of overload and burnout, of 24-7 communications, physiological breakdowns from stress, mental illness that's on the rise, particularly depression and anxiety. But I want to ask you today, how many times in scripture are we invited to refreshing and rest? But is this a part of how we plan our time? As stress has mounted and discretionary time has disappeared, many are advocating for a return to simplicity and soul care that our fast-paced modern world has stolen from us. Even conventional time management is getting retooled. So Bruce Miller has written this book, which I'm going to highly recommend to you today, Your Life in Rhythm, and he points this out in a striking way as he begins. He says, do you ever feel overwhelmed? Are you juggling responsibilities at home, work, church, and school? And does it seem you have at least one too many balls in the air? As you've been juggling priorities and doing your best to keep everything going, has someone told you in one way or another that you need to get your life in balance? Stephen Covey writes in Forbes magazine, the challenge of work-life balance is without question one of the most significant struggles faced by modern man. I've surveyed thousands of audiences about their greatest personal and professional challenges. Life balance is always at or near the top. But what if this pursuit of balance is part of the problem rather than the solution? Scientists are discovering that living rhythmically leads to healthier lives. If you think about it, it makes sense. Our entire world moves in rhythms. Seasons change. Winter gives way to spring, which heats up into summer and cools into fall. And then winter comes again. It doesn't happen like that in Phoenix, but I'm telling you, this is how it happens around the world. The moon waxes and wanes. The sun rises and sets. Life oscillates. It is not linear or uniform. Our very lives are dependent on rhythms. From the beating of our hearts to the breathing of our lungs to our need for food and sleep, our bodies function according to rhythms. And so today, the Lord is going to give us a better way to think about how we have been created, and I think to begin to integrate some of the things that we have been learning together. God actually took me to two places to teach me this message after such a long season of pouring out as I walked both of my parents to heaven over an 18-month period. And as I was writing this series, these two living lessons were placed before me by my bridegroom who took me on an extended trip to get me away to rest. The first place was the hot springs of Colorado, and David had planned a full week for me to soak in the hot springs. With my lupus, this is one of the best things I can do to recover and to get strength, to gain strength, and so this was a, a fabulous time for the two of us to be together, and these springs of refreshment and healing reminded me that God was serious about my rest and recovery. But then we had a second leg to the trip as we traveled to Ohio, and God took us into Amish country. And the Lord showed me a way of living that restores a rhythm as God has designed. Simplicity, natural rhythms of the sun and moon. No electricity to keep going at night. No uh, outside technology that rules our days. Everything handmade and homemade at all of the stores and restaurants that you would go to, fabulous. And a cadence that is based on seasons. So as I picked up this Amish brochure, 
this came home to roost in my soul in every season. Spring, planting crops and flowers, turning cows out to pasture, maple sugaring, who doesn't want to do that in the spring? Enjoying fresh strawberry pie, taking a buggy ride. Summer, hay making and wheat threshing, making berry jam, rocking and relaxing on the porch, catching fireflies after dark. Fall, pressing cider and cooking apple butter, sharing a meal around the table, shopping for handcrafted gifts, enjoying delightful fall colors. Winter, strolling through the snow, sipping cocoa by the fire, playing board games with family and friends, savoring a hearty breakfast. Doesn't that sound inviting? Mm -hmm. Do you remember days in your younger years when we actually lived, not according to a time management system, but according to a seasonal calendar that shifted and changed? And we want to talk today about that. I really believe that this is the pivot point of this series because now we're going to talk about how to integrate all we've learned about rest and relationship into our lives in a way that honors all God has created us to be and also to do. So let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to sit at your feet one more time today. And I pray that as you pour out this message, our hearts would be enlightened to see how you have designed us for love. How you want us to understand the height and the depth and the breadth and the length of your love in Christ Jesus. How we were made to be image bearers of him and of you. And how you have made us for so much more than what this world offers. So Father, in the places where we have looked to those around us to show us how to walk according to um, how we spend our time, I pray today that you would shift us to a place of how to steward our time uh, before you in this life that you've given us and in the eternal life to come. May our hearts be set on eternity and may we have some pivot points in our teaching today that will help us to live out the truths you've shared with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We'll take your handouts and follow along. The first thing that I want you to see is how our world determines time. We have time management systems that have been developed decade after decade after decade for the whole of my life at least, which is 60 years, and I have used some of them. This is a billion dollar industry that has told us how we can be most productive in our lives. That's our world. But we forget this is God's world. It's not our world. And God has a design for this. His sense of time is actually built on purpose, not productivity. Mm -hmm. That's your first fill in the blank. His sense of time is built on purpose, not productivity. We could pray and go home right now and ponder that one statement, and that might change yeah. how we determine what our days are going to look like. But let's talk a little bit more about God's order. We see his order in creation. He said that there was night and there was day, the first day. God ordered his creation according to night first, rest, mm -hmm. and then day. That, again, is a different model that we live on. He ordered creation according to seasons, which we'll talk a little bit more. God has an order of rule, and that rule means that we are boundaried in some ways. We are boundaried by law, by territory, boundaried by time, by bent, Raise up a child in the way that he shall go. His bent is what the Hebrew means, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. Why? Because if you raise your child according to their bent, they're always going to bend toward their bent. And if you f figure out their purpose and destiny, they will walk in that, and you will train them to do so. That's what that verse means. And so we are boundary by the way God made us. We're boundary by structures that God has put into place. Scripture says that even the seas are boundary to not come any further than the shoreline as God determines. So it's important for us to understand God's order of rule. God has an order to remembrance. So he set up feasts for his people that they would remember on the calendar consistently the things that he had done. He told them to put remembrance stones in certain places to recall 
his faithfulness in those ways. God's people built altars throughout the Old Testament, and those altars stood for moments of commitment before the Lord. These were God's order of remembrance. And then God even has order in a constant flow. And this is why he says, rejoice, how often? Always. Pray without ceasing. Always devoting yourself, always, to certain things. Because God has a constant flow of the way that he orders things. And you and I might say, wow, that sounds really overwhelming. I can't do that all the time. Of course we can. We were designed to. God said so. And so we see a cadence to the way that God created things that moves and shifts, not necessarily in the ways that we determine, but certainly in the rhythms that he has established. That even means that while we multitask, we can be connecting to him. I love this quote by Quaker missionary Thomas Kelly, who wrote in his classic book, A Testament of Devotion. There is a way of ordering our mental life on more than one level at once. On one level, we may be thinking, discussing, seeing, calculating, meeting all the demands of ex external affairs. But deep within, behind the scenes at a profounder level, we may also be in prayer and adoration, song and worship, and a gentle receptiveness to divine breathings. And that is how we can pray without ceasing, how we can focus on the Lord at all times, how we can be devoted always, how we can rejoice no matter what happens. So the Lord has showed me five ways today to bring order to our lives and be able to do the things that he has taught us to do in rest and relationship while we are still serving and giving and working for his honor and glory. So let's look at these five things together and see what the Lord would reveal to us. The first one is rhythms. Look at Ecclesiastes 3.1. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. God is saying here that he doesn't run out of time. There is a time for everything, and then we need to figure out what his time management system looks like that allows for that to be true, and we're going to talk about that. So let's look at three different aspects of time together as we determine what we mean by rhythms of time. So let me define that for you first. What is a rhythm in this sense? What are we talking about here? Rhythms. Rhythm provides a steady and predictable structure to your life while still providing room for nuance and flexibility. It allows us to establish a sense of order and reliability, but leaves room for unexpected shifts and transitions. We can establish a daily rhythm by waking up and going to bed at consistent times, having regular meals, and allocating specific time for work, pleasure, and worship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A good example of that, of having a consistent time to wake up in the morning and go to bed, it's interesting, scientists, sleep scientists have just determined that it is much more important for you to wake up at the same time every morning than it is for you to sleep a number of hours a night. That your body is designed to wake up at the same time, and if you will do just that one thing, even if you lose sleep on the other end sometimes, your body will adjust. Mm -hmm. Why? Because God has designed you that when the sun comes up, you come up. You get up. Uh, the sun ruled by day. The moon ruled by night. There was a rule and order to that, and we even see that in the rhythm of our rising with the sun. So, what are some examples of rhythms? Let me give you a few. First, the circadian rhythms in our own bodies. This is something I had to learn during my adrenal crash because when my body just stopped and went into hibernation, my organ systems began to shut down. I had six organ systems that were affected by that adrenal crash and they all shut down systematically by percentage based on what would keep me alive. God has made the body to do that, so I wasn't running at capacity on my heart, my lungs, my skin, my digestive system, my brain, all of them were affected, but they shut down by percentage according to what would keep me alive, but not what would help me to thrive. And I had to heal and come through that. But did you know that even organ systems are on a time clock in your body? And when you sleep at night, organ systems recover and they do it at certain times. 
on the clock. So if you're having some symptoms that happen or you're waking up at the same time every night, um, you can find out what that time is linked to in your organ recovery. Mm -hmm. And it may be that you, you have a struggle in that particular health range of that, something else that I learned as I was recovering. We have seasonal rhythms, and these rhythms happen yearly. We know that, spring, summer, winter, uh, fall. We also know that they happen to us physically. So we women are aware of this. We can think of our own cycle of being a woman and see how we cyclically have seasons of life. In the spring, when you're a young woman and you come into a time when you can, can even have the capacity to be fertile and have a baby. The summer years of a woman's life when she is um, giving birth to babies and raising them, and this is the most productive hormonal time in her life in the summer. We all know what it feels like to head into that fall season when maybe we're getting perimenopausal and we're not there yet, but we're beginning to go into a fall time of womanhood that feels different than the spring and summer did. And for those of us who have passed through the range of that, and crossed over the great divide of post-menopause, <laughs> and now are free of some of that hormonal chaos, uh, life is calmer, and our bodies are, are a little bit slower, and there's a, a, a winter cadence to that. We experience that as women, even, in how the seasons of our life feel, in the way that God made us. We can feel that spiritually. Do you know and can you discern the season you're in spiritually right now? Um, after going through what I went through with my parents, I'm in a winter season right now. I need to rest and recover. And God made winter to be a time of quietness, a time when the harvest was over and the agricultural season stopped and they recovered from the work of the year and they spent more time inside with family, more time, the days were shorter, the nights were longer, they spent more time resting. That's what I need right now in my life. Do you know what season you're in right now? Because they change. So you may have a spring season. It doesn't matter how old you are, how long you've known the Lord. You'll find this in your <coughs> own cadence of how he works in your life spiritually. We see this in the scriptures. God said there were times for waiting that he brought into the spiritual lives of his people. You all have had waiting seasons. There was a time for war in the Old Testament. The men didn't go to war all the time. This is when David stayed back from the battle. It says, now, in the season that men went to war, there was a time that men went to war in those days. And again, there was a cadence to the way that God, a rhythm to the way that God laid out time. Suffering is a good example of this. Suffering is a divine season of redirection, rest, reframing for us. Mm -hmm. And many of us have experienced that, and we can think about it in those terms. This is what the Lord means when he describes in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, this picture of the rhythm of life. He says this, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. That's fascinating, isn't it? A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. Again, very interesting. A time for war and a time for peace. Rhythms of time before the Lord. Now let's talk about reviewing time then, because if that's not the way we've looked at it, how can we really redirect our thinking? So how do you view time? What does it mean to you? In his book, Margin, which I am also going to suggest you look at, Richard A. Swenson, MD, says this about time. To understand how a society experiences time, examine its operative vocabulary. We talk of no time, lack of time, not enough time, or being out of time. Trying to get more time, we borrow time only to incur a time debt and end up with even less time. <laughs> management in the workplace is so time conscious that they practice time management skills and time compression techniques. They use a computerized timepiece to assure work efforts are time 
intensive. This sense of time urgency creates time pressure and time stress. And wasn't it interesting that everything stopped on a dime when COVID came? And all of that time management and all of that productivity changed because the Lord of the universe, who created the heavens and the earth, and is the Lord of time and eternity, decided that we were all going to stop and have a heavenly time out. And didn't that feel different? Um, and the realization that we are not always in control and that the clock is not always in control. But it sure does feel like that sometimes. Somebody has well said, the clock rules us by day and electric light rules us by night. Mm -hmm. They gave us the gift of time, then took it away. Mm -hmm. And I'll add a third thing to that. Technology changed how we looked at time. Because our younger generations are on their phones at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, texting each other, looking at social media, adding things to their own feeds. It's amazing. Did you know that in 1930, futurists predicted a two-day work week because industrialism would produce so fast? Well, that didn't happen. Testimony was given before a 1967 Senate subcommittee that predicted that by 1983, the work week would be 22 hours long and we would only work 27 weeks out of the year because we would be so productive. That didn't work either. Mm -hmm. What actually happened is the opposite. Mm -hmm. We have gotten more stressed and more busy and under more time pressure. Their question then was, what would we do with all the extra time? And our question now is, where is there any extra mm -hmm. time? Isn't that fascinating? Peggy Noonan, journalist, says this, so many of us feel we have no time to cook, and serve a lovely three-course dinner, to write a long, thoughtful letter, to ever so patiently tutor the child. But other generations, not so long ago, did. And we have more time-saving devices than they did. So what has happened to us? Well, I want you to see that God refers to two kinds of time in his scripture. And let's look at those two words together. The first is chronos. That is linear time. The aspect of just the, the clock ticks down. It's how we think about time in terms of seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, and years. Chronos is objective and consistent, ticking away uniformly. When you consider chronos time, here are two things that you can do in order to manage that kind of time. The first is follow the pace of the Holy Spirit leading and prompting you. Some of you have talked about that in our discussion today. The second, build in rhythms, routines, and rituals that produce peace, joy, and passion for what God has called you to do. And you'll be glad that that's three of our five points today. Routines, rhythms, and rituals. We're going to talk about how to do that. The second kind of time that God mentions in his scripture is kairos. This represents an opportune time. It focuses on the significance of a moment, emphasizing the quality of an experience rather than its duration. It is often associated with moments of inspiration, innovation, and decisive action. Kairos moments are often seen as the right time for something to happen. This was the word used about Esther for such a time as this. God raised her up for a kairos moment, an opportune time, and God used her powerfully. I want you to start thinking about these two types of time because we usually order our entire life according to chronos time, but God orders so much of what he does through kairos time. So here's a couple of ways that you can tap into God's uh, timepiece on Kairos time. First, expect the unexpected and remove the limits off God in how he can show up in your life and in your circumstances. And the second, take advantage of the season you're in, the people in your life, and what's in your hands as you discern how God is moving right now and how he wants you to respond. The reason that it matters 
is because everybody needs these following things. Everybody needs personal time, family time, relational time, and God time. That's what Dr. Swenson says in his book, Margin. The truth is that unless we learn these rhythms of God in our lives, these are the four areas that get hit first as we continue to tick off our to-do list. And that's why it's so important for us to talk about that. So rhythms instead provide for these by replacing urgency with intentionality. Um, and the more intentional we are, the more God can use us in time to do what he's given us to do. Now let's talk then about reordering time. And this is where I want you to make one of those pivot steps that I talked about in basketball when I used to play. Balance versus rhythms. We have been taught that we should be balanced. In his book, Your Life in Rhythm, Bruce Miller asks us to make a pivot to rhythms. And I want to talk about the difference. Balance is a teeter-totter of equality. It's equilibrium. That's the whole point of a teeter-totter. But that means that we think in terms of equality and equilibrium. Is my work life the same equal balance as my home life? Is my internal world equally as important as my external doings? But equilibrium is almost impossible to get to. The reality is most of you today talked about needing to remain flexible and being open to what the Lord has within the realm of time. And if that's true, then rhythms work a lot better because rhythms are not a teeter-totter. Rhythms are the waves and currents of the ocean. And let me give you an example of the difference. A teeter-totter balance is saying, God made night and day, 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night. But what happens in time because of the currents of the ocean? As the seasons progress, the days are longer when we need to be more productive and the nights are shorter. But as the Lord gives us seasonal breaks in order to rest, what happens? The days get shorter, the nights get longer, we rest more in the fall and winter seasons in preparation for the long days of spring and summer to be productive and then to bring in the harvest. That's rhythm, that's not balance. Balance would be 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night, and God would have made them equal and always the same. But they're not. They change. That's rhythm. And we are suggesting that we return to God's order of creation and think of our time in life in terms of this. Bruce Miller says this, balance suggests you can have it all now. Rhythm suggests you can have much over time. Isn't that wise? Mm -hmm. yep. And that's a big shift right there. So my question to you today is where do you feel disordered? Where are you excelling? Where are you depleted? Where are you hopeful? Are you feeling creative or constrained right now? These are important questions to ask yourself in order to establish rhythms that will help in that. And I'll tell you a model that I came across in my young years as a Bible teacher when I learned more about the Hebrew model of life, how God's people ordered their days. Our Western time management is based on a linear order. What's your big three of the day? What's your top priority? What's your to-do list? Have you put these things in order of what you're going to do first and last? This isn't how the Hebrew model of time works. God's people set up a circular model of time management. And on their circular model were the top seven things that they needed to attend to in their life in order to do what was most important everywhere, not just one thing at a time. And so on their circular model... They might have seven different things. It might be their work. It might be their home, their marriage, their children, their quality time with the Lord. The seven things that were most important. And their model was, 
hit all seven things every day. It doesn't matter how long it takes you to do it. When I began to do this, it didn't matter if I needed to spend six hours that day studying in the Word in order to prepare to minister. If I took 15 minutes to sit with my husband and pour into him, if I wrote him a note and left it in his, uh, in his lunch area, and that took me five minutes, it didn't matter the amount of time. It mattered that in the day, I was strategically giving myself to the things that were most important in my world. And what happens if we are intentional about investing? This was intentionality and investment. Mm -hmm. This wasn't based on how long it took to do it. Mm -hmm. But I knew that every day in my own world, I was building relationships with my family and friends. I was taking personal time in order to take care of myself. I was accomplishing my work. I was resting before the Lord and with Him. Every day, I was, I was faithfully stewarding what the Lord had given me to do. Do you see the difference mm -hmm. of the linear way and the circular way? So I think that that's insightful to you as we talk about how to strategically put rhythms into our world. Now let's talk about the second way that we can return to God's order, and that is through rituals. Look at Exodus 23, 4. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, sacred gatherings, which you shall proclaim at this time set for them throughout the year, the Lord said. That is God's order of rituals. He set up a calendar year where they feasted consistently, and it was based on the agricultural seasons. It was based on the religious seasons of life, and it was beautiful. Those of you who did the feast study with us some years ago saw how profound this way of living was in celebrating and commemorating what God had done. So let's define what, we talk, what we're talking about rituals, what we mean. Rituals add meaning and significance to various aspects of our life, highlighting the sacred and special. They can help us celebrate achievements, express gratitude, and connect with our values and beliefs. Examples include special family dinners, anniversaries, seasonal church services, annual traditions, and celebrations. One thing I want to say to you about this is every moment is a treasure and a trust. Every moment is a treasure and a trust. It's a great gift, but we choose how we spend it. And God has written into his word specific times that should be given to focus on him and his unfolding plan and purposes. And as I taught you in that feast study, every feast reveals Jesus in some way. Every doctrine of the New Testament church is planted into every Old Testament feast. You could literally teach your children the entire plan of God by feasting throughout the entire year. Who doesn't want to, what kid doesn't want to have a party like consistently uh, every month or two throughout the calendar year? What a great way. We used to do this with our girls and we would, we would practice some of the things that were so strategic in the feasts and it was beautiful. These were times of remembrance before the Lord. Again, I've said it, but I'll say it again. This involved feasts. It involved remembrance stones that he told his people to put in strategic places to remember his faithfulness. It involved altars, and, and all of us should have those symbolically in our lives in some way. Things that help us, celebrations, commemorations, commitments to the Lord, times of confession to clean our house, so to speak, before the Lord. That's what those believers who practice Lent do this for that purpose. It reflects on what Rosh Hashanah was for in the Old Testament, that feast of trumpets to call us to account before the Lord. That's why the Jewish people in the fall season of Rosh Hashanah confess their sins before the Lord. They go into the days of awe, 30 days they spend in repentance before they come up close to the Day of Atonement. That's because they believe there's only one day of the year where the Lord wipes their slate clean wipes out the transgressions of the past year, and they'll literally go to a body of water, write all of their sins on pieces of paper, and cast it into the sea, because uh, he cast our sins into the depths of the sea. How incredible to teach a child what that looks like by doing that every single year. 
do you see how the pictures just bring the spiritual aspects of our life um, into view and help us to be before the Lord consistently? So you may ask, well, I'm confused. What's the difference between a rhythm and a ritual then? How would I know which one is which? Let me just give you what I would consider a difference. I think as we gather as God's women every week to do Bible study in the fall and the spring, that's a rhythm. I think this is a spiritual rhythm for you. Sometimes maybe you can't come on a week, something else is going on, but this is a rhythm of your life. And those of you who have been a part of this rhythm would say this has been so valuable mm -hmm. to have this as a spiritual rhythm in your week, something for you to look forward to. I would say in our spiritual lives, communion is a ritual. Mm -hmm. Bible study is not a ritual, it's a rhythm. But communion is a ritual. There's just a there's a there's a higher sense. We don't do it as often, but it it reminds us of something that's so high and sacred. This, by the way, is one of the reasons that some of our evangelical kids are flocking to the Catholic Church today, because they are responding to this sense of ritual and seeing some things that come um, in the calendar year that are are picturesque to them of spirituality. There's this, a reverence to it that feels different than some of our American um, jumbotron evangelical church mm -hmm. that has come to be. And so this is the difference between rhythms and rituals and how we can distinguish between both of them. But both of them are hugely important in God's way that he created us to be able to be in relationship with him. The third thing I want to talk about today is routines. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This speaks to routines. These are things that are routine to us, that happen every day, or consistently enough that we don't really think about them. They're things that we have built into the way that we approach our lives. So let's define what we mean by routine. A well-structured routine can reduce stress and ensure that we make time for essential activities. They help provide structure and boundaries to maximize productivity. We may have a routine for how we wake up, go to bed, have our quiet time, order our day, or how we determine our meals each week. I call them patterns of purpose. I think that we can develop routines in, in how we rest, in our relationships, in our service and in our work that can serve mental energy and cultivate creativity. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. I think probably most of us as women have a getting ready routine. Mm -hmm. Like I think you do the same things in a certain order when you get ready. And I couldn't figure out for a lot, long time, why does the Lord speak to me when I'm in the shower or when I'm curling my hair? And I finally figured it out because when I am doing a routine and I'm not thinking about it, mm -hmm. it creates space mm -hmm. in my mind and in my heart. And God would come in and fill that space. He would, he would show me the messages he wanted me to give. He would start to piece together mm -hmm. the things that he wanted me to share with you. He would speak to me about things that I needed to hear in my private world. Any time you can establish a routine, no matter what it is, let me give you another example of that. Have you ever been driving your car and then it just hit you? I didn't even think about driving the car and I'm at this place. Like, how did the car know to get here? We don't even think about it because certain routes we take have gotten so routine, we don't have to think about it. So our mind has released that. We talked last night about uh, writing things down, whether it's a journal or whether it's your to-do list or calendar or whatever, and somebody had expressed I'm, I'm really feeling like I'm losing it because I, I write down everything, but then I can't remember in my head. And I said, yes, that's the point. That's why we write down everything. That's why journaling is so powerful. We make space when we get things out and down. We don't have to think about it because we know where to go to get it. Now we can open up space. The thing that's remarkable about routines and these patterns is that as we do this, we will find God speaking more clearly to us, and we will find room for creativity. That's because we're image bearers of him. And I'm afraid that without routines, we have so filled up the space of our lives, our homes, 
the clutter that's around us, the noise that's around us, everything in our heads that we don't have any space to be creative anymore. We don't have any space to just sit with him and be open. And routines help us to be able to do that. So I want to encourage you to think about how you can build routines into your life. And I'm going to give you some practical ways to do that as you take your homework home with you this week and as you look at these resources that I'm going to recommend. The fourth thing that we can learn about how God orders things that are so important is resets. These are purposeful times when the Lord wants us to stop, evaluate, and pivot to something different. Let me give you a poignant verse from Jeremiah that speaks to this. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. Isn't that incredible that God's children over and over told him again, nope, We've heard clearly what you are saying to us, but we will not do it. We've looked at some of those verses on rest out of the prophets, but we were not, but they were not willing, but they would not. And here the Lord says, I want you to stop and consider where you are, and I want you to return to the right way. And if you will do that, you will be blessed. But his people said, Nope, we are not going to change our course. And I'm going to suggest to you that resets are important in your life before the Lord. So what do we mean by that? These are seasons in our lives when a reset is in order. It's a chance to break free from unproductive patterns or habits and to acknowledge what is no longer serving you. When we encounter setbacks or face burnout, resets can involve reassessing your goals, seeking new perspectives, or making significant changes to your routine or environment. There are some really strategic resets in scripture, and I just want to point out uh, a few stories and give you some insights about that. So let's look at some resets from God's word. The first is John Mark. Remember, as a very young disciple, he went on his first missionary journey with Barnabas and Paul, and along the way, he determined that was not for him. And he turned around and hightailed it back to Mama. And Barnabas, the encourager, <laughs> wanted to just encourage John Mark and give him more time, and Paul was like, no way. He's not going to be here, then he is not going to be in service with us. And in fact, Barnabas and Paul split over this issue of what to do with this young man who wasn't quite ready to continue in what God had given him. John Mark needed a reset of determination, and sometimes you may need that reset. You know what's sweet at the end of Paul's life? When he's in prison in Rome, he says to Timothy, I don't have much time left. I know my days are numbered. I'm going to ask you to bring me some things so I can see you one more time. But bring John Mark with you because he's profitable to me. And Paul even had a reset in that, didn't he? Mm -hmm. It wasn't just John Mark. But this is a reset of determination, and every one of us needs that sometimes in our spiritual life. The second one is Jonah. And this was a reset of direction. Now, we're kind of hard on Jonah sometimes. Uh, I don't think we understand the whole story. But it, if you know this, the story of Jonah being asked to go to Nineveh and tell them, God has seen you and loves you and wants to pour mercy out on you. And if you'll turn your hearts to him, he is going to um, allow you to not be destroyed. So Assyria was the Nazi of that day and time. They were so brutal to God's people. They're the ones who originated crucifixion, by the way. Jesus would have his form of death because of the way Assyrians treated God's people. And they didn't do it with a cross. They did it with a stake. Through a body just hanging by the thousands of God's people who died this way by the hands of Assyria. They tortured. They maimed. They persecuted. And Jonah watched his people get decimated by this society. And then God says to his prophet, I want you to head straight to Nineveh and I want you to tell them that I love them and that I'm going to pour mercy out on them. And this was like you being told, I want you to go and tell Adolf Hitler that regardless of what he has done, I am going to forgive him and I am going to bless him. And you might find yourself in the same position 
as Jonah at that particular time. Jonah needed a reset of direction, and God provided that for him. And he began to ask questions, and you can understand why. One of his questions was, really? Mercy for them? Why? You and I may look around the world today, and we have questions. God, what do you feel about what's happening here? Why are you allowing this to happen? What about, what about this? And ultimately, when Jonah had his pity party at the end of the Nineveh situation, and he, he got hot under the burning sun, his big question was, and, and where's the mercy for me? And you and I have questions in our spiritual life. And you know, this is a great story to remind us of that. But one of the things we don't readily understand about the story, beyond why it was such a conflict for Jonah, was how God used uh, a fish in order to become an Uber ride for Jonah. <laughs> to pick him up where he was at and get him to where he needed to go. What's so interesting about that is the Ninevites worshipped a fish god. Their god was a fish, and they had fish stamped on all of the walls of Nineveh. That was the big deal. Can you imagine when the Uber ride pulls up to the shore, spits out this man of God, and it's their god who has brought this man all of a sudden, the heart of Nineveh flies open. Their ears are open. Their hearts are eager. Their God just delivered a man to them to tell them something important. What was it? And they turned their heart to the true God. Isn't that interesting how God uses all? Even in your life, when you may want to head in a different direction because your questions are bigger than what God has asked you to do. And we need that kind of reset sometime in our spiritual lives. The Galatians had a reset. This was a reset when they were double-minded. Remember, Paul said to them, you were running well. Who knocked you out of the race? And sometimes we are running well, and all of a sudden something happens. We get distracted. We feel defeated. Things aren't going well. We get disillusioned. And we fall away mm -hmm. out of the race. James said, what we are to do when we find ourselves in this situation. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near. And that is a solution for us. That's a reset that you and I will have to take into account when we find ourselves off course somehow. The fourth is Peter, and this was a reset of devotion. This is why the Lord asked him, Do you love me three times after he denied him? Sometimes we need a reset of devotion when we find ourselves having done something that has dishonored the Lord. You know what I find so interesting about this account of Peter with his denial is the Lord told him about his denial before it happened in order to comfort him and to direct him. And what the Lord said to him, I said to one of my girls when she went into a struggle as a young teen, this was so profound to me. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Not that you will not fail. Jesus didn't pray to keep Peter from denying. He said, I want you to know I've already prayed for what you haven't even done yet. And what I have prayed is that your faith will not fail. And even when Peter failed, you need to hear this today because some of you have carried guilt for things that have happened that have taken you off course from the Lord. But your faith is solid because Jesus prays for you. He intercedes for you before the throne of God. And these are some of the most precious words that came right out of Jesus' mouth after that. And Peter, when you have returned, encourage your brothers. When you have returned, Jesus even told what would happen. Yes, you're going to have a test. Yes, you're going to fail that test, but your faith isn't going to fail, and you're going to return to me. And when you return to me, you're not done in the ministry I have for you. And this is what I want you to do. Don't you love that? Don't you want to hear that? When you need this kind of a reset in your own life? But this same reset was offered to two other of God's servants who decided not to take it. One was Eli, who God sent 
Samuel to to tell him, man, your boys who are priests are messing everything up. They are not following the Lord, and the Lord is going to judge them if they do not change their ways. And Eli did not have the courage to correct his boys. He mentioned it to them, but he did not make them return to the ancient path. And God ended up taking their lives, as he said that he would. And do you know how Eli died? He was a man of great, uh, what do you call it? Stature. Stature. <laughs> he was portly, and he was old, and he was sitting on a chair, and when they came and told him that these boys had been slaughtered in war, as God said that they would be, he fell backward on his chair and was killed. What's fascinating to me is Judas had the opposite experience. Judas also had a chance, I think, to return to the ancient path. This is why I think Jesus warned Judas in the upper room. Uh, somebody's going to betray me, and it's the one who is dipping his bread with me right now. He identified, he knew what Judas was going to do. Judas could have made a decision at that point. You know what, Lord, I don't know what I'm thinking. I'm not going to do that. When Judas came and kissed Jesus on the teach, on, on, the, on the cheek, Jesus said to him, friend, friend, do what, do what you've come to do. Again, another chance for Judas to connect with the Lord instead of carrying out what he was going to do. Judas would not turn, would not return to the ancient path. What happened to Judas? He hung himself, but then something else happened to his body. Eli fell backward. Judas fell forward. Mm -hmm. Judas fell headlong onto that field, and all of the decay of his body spilled out mm -hmm. onto this ground and affected others to the point where they had to buy that field with the money that he had used to betray Jesus, and the only thing it was good for was burial, decay. That was all it was ever going to be good for. And here's the lesson that I think we can hear from that. When we don't go back and reset, we fall forward to destruction, our own and even others. So I am inviting you to take seriously this fourth way that we can... Uh, follow God's order. I love what Richard Rohr has said. All great spirituality is about letting go. So what might need a divine reset in your heart right now? Is there anything missing? Confusing? Feeling lifeless? Are there ways you are experiencing chaos rather than calm? Then you need a reset. And lastly today, renewal. This is the fifth way that we can return to God's order. Look at Ruth 4.15. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by renewal? Regular renewal activities are crucial for maintaining balance and preventing burnout. These activities allow us to recharge physically, mentally, and emotionally. Engage in practices like prayer and meditation, mindfulness, play, or vacations to rejuvenate our energy and enthusiasm for life. So here are some ways we see renewal in the scriptures. The Bible begins with the creation of the heavens and earth and ends with the recreation of a new heaven and a new earth, renewal. The second way, his mercies are new every morning, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. What's interesting about the Hebrew is the word mercy doesn't have a plural, but it literally says his mercies. Mm -hmm. God broke the grammar in order to tell you that it's not just his mercy that's new for you every day. It's mercy after mercy after mercy after mercy. Mm -hmm. Because he is a God of renewal. The third way, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Who doesn't need some renewal of strength today? Isaiah 40, 31. The fourth, in Christ we are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And finally, in Isaiah 43, 19 through 20, the prophet says, Forget the former things. I will do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Are you looking for that new thing? Are you looking for the renewal that the Lord constantly wants to bring you? How do you need to be renewed right now? And how would the Lord want to bring that to you? So I'm going to suggest as we wrap up today that you take inventory. What new thing is God doing in my life? What new people has he placed in my path? What new commitment is he asking me to make? Am I dreaming God-sized possibilities? And the third book that I'm going to suggest to you today is called Rhythms of Renewal. It's the only book that I've mentioned that's written by a woman, Margin, by Dr. Swenson, uh, Your Life in Rhythm by Bruce Miller. This one, Rhythms of Renewal by Rebecca Lyons. 
an incredible book. In this book, she says she believes there are four rhythms of renewal that matter for us in our lives as women. Two of them are internal rhythms, rest and restore. The other two are external rhythms, connect and create. She gives seven practical ways in each of those four things that you can set up a new rhythm in your life that will bring renewal to you. That means 28 ways to reorder your life. And if you can only get one resource, this saved my life when I had my adrenal crash and helped me to reorder my life according to all five things that I've told you today. Rhythms, rituals, routines, resets, and renewal. So I highly commend that book to you as one of the practical ways you can put into practice what we've talked about today. So as we wrap up, God gave me visual reminders this last summer of his heart and his hope for me. Springs of refreshment and healing in Colorado, a way of living that restores a rhythm of living he designed for me to have in Amish country. So my question for you today is, is your life well-ordered and well-oiled with the Holy Spirit? In which of these five things could you be more intentional in stewarding your time? Rhythms, rituals, routines, resets, or renewal? Here is a prayer and a promise from the Lord as we close today. From Psalm 90, verse 12. This is the New American Standard Bible. So teach us to number or order our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. That Hebrew word present is important. It's not just that you will gain it for yourself. It's that you will reach out and give it to the Lord. Someday you're going to stand before him and give an account for every moment. Every word that came out of your mouth. Every action, every attitude. And the way that you spent or stewarded your time. So, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may present to you the heart of wisdom that you gave us because we established our lives according to your order. And here is the promise. Ecclesiastes 3, 11 in the Amplified. He has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has also planted eternity, which is a sense of divine purpose in the human heart, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. So if I put these two verses together, this is the last question that I want to ask you today. Will you present to him a well-ordered heart that is purposeful, filled with eternal perspective? Let's pray. Father, I just ask that you would take all of these pictures that you've given us, all of these principles, and that you would allow us to plant them deeply in our souls, in our spirits, in our bodies, in our minds, that we may present to you lives that are purposeful and that are eternal in all of the things that we do, even when they are determined by the clicking of a clock. Father, may we live in chronos time effectively, but may we live in hyros time in ways that are eternal and important for the kingdom of God. Teach us to order our days. Thank you for the resources that you have given us to do them. And I pray for every woman who has heard this, that you may lead her specifically and strategically to practice the things that you have taught us today. In Jesus' name.